All right, so our case this month starts with a 45-year-old cirrhotic gentleman. This is the patient we all know and love. Walks in, looks like he's in the advanced stages of pregnancy, right? And he's here for shortness of breath and some abdominal discomfort. Now, this gentleman had his last paracentesis about a month ago, and you see that his vital signs are really only notable for a slightly elevated respiratory rate because he really can't breathe that well due to his huge abdomen. Otherwise, his blood pressure, his heart rate, are fine. Um, and he doesn't have a fever. That's important as well. So Swami, tell me, what are your decision points in terms of deciding what you're going to do next in his management? I think what we're running into is, are we going to do that therapeutic paracentesis to make the patient feel a little better? Or are we going to do that? But we're also worried that there could be something a little bit more pathologic going on. So if this is a patient that you see frequently in your emergency department, then I want to get a little sense from maybe some of the staff, some of the RNs, maybe some of the other docs. Hey, you know this guy pretty well. You've seen him before. How does he look to you? Ask the patient, does this feel like your usual? Does it feel any different? I have a very low threshold to do an extensive workup in these patients because they're very fragile. But if the patient tells me I get a paracentesis every month, I feel like I always do when I get my paracentesis, then I'm probably going down that route. Yeah, I agree. I think that this could be a very straightforward thing. We always have to remember that, you know, could it be pneumonia? Could it be PE? Like not anchor too much on a repetitive complaint for a patient. So we want to make sure there's not something else going on. But then let's say that we go through those things and, you know, all the answers are pretty straightforward. There's no new fever. Nothing's really changed. I always ask about urine output, thinking about how these patients are at risk for hepatorenal syndrome. Mm. Nothing's changed there. I also ask about medication compliance because, you know, in terms of ascites, are, is this a diuretic, you know, responsive ascites or resistant? I'm guessing this is probably a diuretic resistant ascites sure. or refractory ascites. Otherwise, this patient wouldn't be here for these repetitive paracentesis. So ask some questions about how the medical management is going in this patient. But then let's say we get to that point, I'm going to do a therapeutic paracentesis on this patient. My question for you, Swami, is do you send labs on this person? Because honestly, there's probably not much in the way of labs that's going to stop me from doing this procedure for this patient. What about you? No, I 100% agree. I don't think there's any lab I'm going to get that's going to say, oh, don't do the procedure, right? If the platelets are, I mean, I guess if the platelets are like under five or under 10, but hopefully I ask the patient, have you had any spontaneous bleeding, stuff like that? I'm not going to change what I do based on an INR, so that's not really going to affect it. I probably am going to get a hemoglobin and some electrolytes, not because it's going to change whether I do the para or not, but just because these patients are so fragile and they can easily become hyponatremic. They can easily tip into a little bit of renal dysfunction. They can easily be anemic. So I'm going to look for those things, but I'm not going to wait for them to do the tap, and they're not going to preclude me from doing the tap. So I'm definitely going to do the tap. I'm going to do a diagnostic because the guy's uncomfortable, he's short of breath. The lab that I am going to send is I'm going to send a cell count on the fluid I get. I always do it. I'm like, listen, I already have the fluid. I, I just, spontaneous bacterial peritonitis is this very, very difficult diagnosis to make at times. It is cryptic and I'm just not going to be fooled. So if I'm taking fluid out of the belly, some of it's going to the lab. I, I completely agree with that. I think there's there have been plenty of papers to suggest that our sensitivity for picking up SBP on physical exam is very, very limited. You cannot count on abdominal tenderness, new abdominal tenderness. They're already tender. They're already uncomfortable. Yep. You just cannot yep. tell. And these can be really sneaky infections and very serious for them. Like you said, they're very medically fragile. We have to consider all those things that they're you know, at risk for the SBP, the GI bleed, all those kinds of things. So I would also send the fluid for some cell count to make sure that I'm not missing a case of SBP. And I think this is a big take home for people like we don't need labs for the most part for the procedure. There really right. isn't going to be like, a, you know, most of the time these guys have low platelets. These patients have thrombocytopenia, but it's not below five or below mm. 10. It's not in that range that we really worry about. You know, it's low, but not that low. Um, so, I, you know, especially if they have labs in the computer from the last month or so. I'm probably not sending it if everything else is normal. In, in, unless they're, you know, I know from those labs that they are trending in a direction of creatinine, et cetera, and I really want to check it. I think that we don't need to reflexively send labs on all these people for the reason of the procedure. So you're going to go get your kit. You're going to go get ready to set up. How Are there any pearls that you teach in terms of how to do a paracentesis? I've read about people using wall suction. I don't use that approach, but I'm just wondering what you do. 
I don't use wall suction either. I use usually the vacuum containers yep. just for the speed of what we're doing. I mean, this guy's got a big, what looks like a gravid abdomen. I'm guessing there's going to be four five, six liters in there. I'm going to want to take off a couple liters. It takes forever to let that fluid just drip through a catheter into a bucket. So I, I like to have the vacuum bottles, but no, I don't hook them up to wall suction. I feel like that's just unnecessary and it feels like it would be uncomfortable as well. I tend to go in the right lower quadrant. That is just kind of what I was taught. It seems to be the best space to kind of go for. And while I did a lot of these blind as a resident, I do them all with ultrasound now. There's like no reason not to take a look. I've been surprised sometimes where I'm like, oh, this person has a bunch of fluid in their belly. I'm going to go tap them. And then I take a look with the ultrasound. And I'm like, I see fluid, but I can't find a pocket to actually go after. I'm worried there's something else in this belly. I'm going to get a CT scan. I'm going to probably send them to IR to get a sample of this fluid. So I always look with the ultrasound. I always try to find a nice pocket. And it looks kind of fancy to see your needle going into the pocket. You just... It gives a little security to everybody. So I will do them all with ultrasound. Obviously, some local anesthesia. I do like the Z technique on the skin to kind of prevent some of the leakage of fluid that can happen afterwards. But I think everyone's got their own kind of approach to doing this. And there's probably a lot of different ways that work. Yeah, I did hundreds of these blind before really we started using ultrasound. And I yeah. completely agree that ultrasound has changed things. Every once in a while, you just find that patient where you were convinced that there would be this pocket and somehow it's complex. So the, the pocket is walled off or not as thick as you wanted or whatever. I don't know. There's something fun, some funky appearance to it. Um, so I think ultrasound is definitely the way to go. I mean, when I've seen these go wrong and I've seen M&Ms on paracentesis, it's usually in cases where people weren't careful about their landmarks. You got to know where those umbilical vessels run. You need to have looked with the ultrasound and be pretty confident. Um, there's not a lot of complications to this procedure. Like it's unlikely that you're going to perforate bowel or that kind of thing, you know, if you're going in the right spots. But, you know, it, it does have its risk in these very fragile patients. And if you're doing it for a therapeutic purpose, just make sure you know what you're doing. Now, I know of some colleagues who work in places where the ED physicians don't do this procedure, that it's IR that does it or yep. even GI that comes in and does it. It's a billable procedure. It's something that sometimes these other folks want to do. So if you're listening to this, you're like, I haven't done a paracentesis in a long time because we just don't do them. I don't think you're alone. I think there are places like that. You've heard of that too? Yeah, absolutely. There are lots of people who will do a small diagnostic tap. They'll get like, a, you know, 20 cc's of fluid out and send it off to make sure there isn't SBP, but they don't do large volume paracentesis anymore. The patients get admitted or they have an outpatient clinic that runs that. But uh, every place that I've worked, either I'm doing it or it ain't getting done. Yeah, that's the case for me too. So let's talk about that large volume paracentesis that you mentioned. What is the cutoff for that? And are you giving albumin if you're oh, taking off more than that? Such a debate. This is like a question that's been debated <laughs> since the beginning of time, Jan, since, <laughs> since medicine began, it's been debated. Should we give albumin or not? And, um, well, there's an answer sort of. <laughs> I mean, if you read the guidelines and you take off more than five liters, the answer is you should be giving it. That is what the right. text That's the say. answer. Yep. That is the answer. The truth is that a lot of us, you know, these patients get that much taken off all the time and they're not getting albumin every single time. So I'm not doing it every single time in those patients that are repeat customers that they were just here a month ago, same procedure, et cetera. But I think if you're doing it, you're not, you're, you are being, that is the way you're supposed to do it. If you're doing large, now some people will just say, I'm just not taking off more than five liters because I don't want to sure. wade into the waters of where albumin is recommended. And that takes time and it's expensive and it's just not something I want to do. So I agree with you. I think there's a lot of gray area here about how emergency physicians practice in terms of large volume paracentesis versus what textbooks say, which I find really interesting. The first time I gave a lecture on this was a few years ago, I don't know, many years ago, I guess, and reading these guidelines and reading about the albumin, I was like, oh, I've been doing this wrong for a long, long time. I've never given albumin to any of these people, you know, but I think that that's just because we're, you know, the patients are want to get out the door. They feel better. They've had it a bunch of times. I mean, I don't know. I don't know how evidence based exactly that that recommendation is. I think I'm doing the same thing that you do in that I usually don't take off five, six, seven liters in the emergency department. If I take off four liters and I'm looking with ultrasound, I'm like, wow, there's a ton of fluid still there. I usually yeah. will be like, you know what, if we need to get more of that fluid out, maybe this person needs to come in and get a drain done, but not like the, I'm going to get this draining done as quickly as humanly possible and get this patient back out the door. So usually I keep it to under five liters. I'm not really sure that the albumin is going to be the thing that really makes the difference for these patients, but 
we are told we're supposed to do it. So if I take more than five liters, I usually will give albumin and I'll look in the chart and see. And if the patient, every time they come in, they get five, six, seven liters taken off and they get albumin, then I'm going to do the same thing that's happened before because I, I don't want to necessarily rock the boat. And the patient usually will have an expectation of, oh yeah, they take off this much and they give me this much. And I'm like, okay, no problem. Yeah. We can make that happen. And we usually, after I've done the procedure, I'm usually waiting for that cell count to come back. So you do have some this period of time yep. that is like an observation for fluid shifting, which is one of the complications and or administration of Albion if you decide to go that route. So I think you have some some options here. Is that also what you do? Yeah, because I got to wait for that cell count. I'm not sending yeah. him home. This isn't a patient where I'm like, I'll call you if the cell count comes back positive. It's like, no, that patient's waiting there until I get my cell count because I, I've been surprised so many times. I'm sure you have too, where I'm like, oh, this person doesn't have SVP. And then the cell count comes back and it's like a thousand. And I'm like, oh crap, they do have SVP. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I just, I don't overthink this anymore. You're yeah. not leaving until I get the cell count back. If I think you need albumin, sure, I'll give you some albumin. Usually I can kind of time it to four liters are gone by the time the cell count comes back and then the patient's ready to go. Kind of wrap it all up together. Let me throw one more wrench in it for you, which is the tap where you put the needle in and you get some bloody fluid back. Oh. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is like kind of a disaster because you're like, you know, if it clears really readily, then I'm like, oh, maybe I just like, nick something on the way in. No big deal. But if it stays bloody, then I'm concerned. And probably yeah. what I'm going to do is probably stop that drainage and get a scan and see what's going on. I, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I've never run into the situation where I've gotten a bloody tap and it stayed bloody. Usually it is. I get a little bit of blood. And then after like a couple hundred cc's, it's now that like straw colored fluid. And I'm like, okay, we're good. But if it continued to be bloody, I would stop the drainage and get a scan. I agree. I think that there's multiple reasons it can be bloody. Now, you could have hit something you don't know at this point. Or I have also seen cases where people have tumors like HCC that's been undetected yep. that's maybe bleeding, you know, subclinically, et cetera, or they've had some other, you know, catastrophe happen. So I agree. I think that the answer would be to stop the tap if it's really not clearing. Get, you know, if you haven't seen your hemoglobin result, find out what that is a little bit more quickly right, right. and consider doing a CT angio to see where the blood might be coming from. And make sure to change your documentation. You didn't do a paracentesis, you did a DPL. <laughs> exactly. And I also look back at to what the fluid looked like, because sometimes some of these people do have like sort of pinkish fluid and they had it last time and this looks the same. I'm a little less concerned. Sure. Again, like looking at that record. So yeah, that's a that's a nice point. So any other pearls that you that you like in these particular cases? Now these patients are just going home with follow up. Anything else that you do? No, I think that's pretty much what I'm doing too. I really do try, if the patient isn't plugged in well, to make sure that they have good GI follow-up. Some hospitals have clinics where they run these paracentesis. They bring the patients in every couple of weeks, take off a couple of liters. So if that exists in the hospital I'm working in, I'll make sure to get the patient plugged in so they can have this care done the right way, as opposed to having come back to the emergency department. Of course, we understand we're the patch. We're always there. And so I expect to see the patient again, but I do whatever I can to get them plugged into the right places. Yeah, I think for me, some of the take home points here in terms of this discussion is number one, that paracentesis is a really safe procedure and it can make patients feel a lot better. I do, I have heard of colleagues that are like, they don't really want to do paracentesis in the circumstances because they feel like it just encourages the patient to come back to the ED for a quick fix rather than, you know, deal with a procedure clinic and making an appointment and waiting till the appointment, et cetera. However, this is a very uncomfortable condition for patients that are towards the end of their life. The mortality for this kind of patient that has refractory ascites as we have already alluded to between their GI bleeds and their hepatorenal syndrome is very high. So making them feel better is to, to me a big priority. That's probably like one of the best things you can do for them, um, especially if they're having shortness of breath and like feeling super uncomfortable. If they're in this stage where the diuretics don't work anymore, then you know, you're probably not going to get very far without doing these kinds of taps. They need this mechanical solution. And if you work in a place where you may be able to refer them to have a, more of a definitive management have one of these catheters like implanted where they can mm. have a drain, that would be good for the real end of life patient. You can have those kinds of, I don't know why we don't see those as often as we do in these patients, but they do exist. You can have one of these drains put in so that they have like permanent drainage, you know, going, going away. Um, so that's one thing to know. Um, this is a pretty safe procedure. Sometimes you get that fluid leakage. We have a really nice video um, of on MRAP HD of how to put the derma bond on if you do have persistent fluid leakage, or you can throw a suture. Both of those techniques work pretty well. Derma bond to me is like the go-to at this point. It just works great. I don't know. Is that what you use when you see these people with leakage? Usually, yeah. A little bit of derma bond goes a long way. Yeah, goes a long way. Um, 
And that's it. There are various techniques out there, but I think this is a procedure that we should all be very, very comfortable with and should not hesitate to do. Yeah, I just want to give a nod to to a patient that I took care of as an intern. And when I say I took care of, every single resident in my program took care of. His name is Gary, not his real name, but that's what we called him. We called him Gary. Gary passed away a couple of years ago, but you know he was actually kind of proud of the fact that Every resident had done a large value in paracentesis on him at some point during their training. He, I remember the first one that I did on him, and he's like, is this the first one you've ever done? I'm like, yeah. He goes, I'll walk you through it. And, you know, <laughs> as sucky as this diagnosis is, as short as the lifespan is, they are giving something, especially in training institutions, to the physicians. And I respect that. And Gary, um, Gary was a great guy. He was fun to talk to while you were doing the procedure. We often didn't have vacuum bottles. So sometimes Gary would be in the department for six, seven, eight hours just to get four or five liters out because we just had to wait for it to drip out. And he would have conversations with everybody and he was a nice guy. And, uh, you know, one of the things I've learned, Jan, I'm sure you have too, is that when these patients come back every two days or every day, you whine and you moan and complain about them. And then when they stop coming back, you're really sad. And so is the rest of the staff. So, Yeah. It's a pain in the butt sometimes, but just remember, you're going to miss them when they're gone. Yeah, embrace it. I agree with you. The humanism of it, you know, these are the opportunity. Every day, every shift you work, one of the antidotes to burnout is to connect with patients. And this is one of those opportunities to sit at a bedside and talk to somebody um, about their life. And they really enjoy it. You don't think, you know, they don't want to be there. You're doing them a mm. big favor. It can be very satisfying if you embrace it in that way that you have the ability to make them feel a lot better, even if it's for a temporary period of time. And it's a really, it can be, it can be a nice moment. And I agree with you. Just flip that annoying scenario to something that that could be very rewarding in multiple ways. All right, Jen, great case for us to get into, something that is so run-of-the-mill. We see it all the time in emergency medicine. Good for us to be boned up on how to take care of those patients. And with that, we're going to dive into the rest of the week. We've got some great segments with Amol Matu. We've got a segment with a new consultant, a new trauma consultant that Jess Werner got to sit down with. But before we get to those segments, let's dip into a couple of papers from EMA. <laughs> 